very much for coming along this evening and thank you very much for the invitation. It's my pleasure to talk to you um, about kind of uh, the new kid on the block in astronomy, namely gravitational waves, which um, though we'll go for the history and it's quite quite a long time since they have been predicted and uh, theoretically, but it's a really new field in terms of observational astronomy. It's only um, about six years old now and we have already made some really exciting discoveries and I'm really looking forward to sharing those with you today. Um, but for us to talk about gravitational waves, we need to go back and look a little bit and talk a little bit about gravity itself. Um, and that means we have to go back all the way to 1915, when uh, a physicist, a very famous physicist, Albert Einstein, came along with his um, rather exotic kind of new theory to describe something that has been around for a long time and is one of the probably most well-known fundamental forces in physics, namely gravity. And in 1915, um, Albert Einstein came and, and postulated uh, quite a new exciting way of describing uh, one of the most fundamental forces, namely the attraction between, um, between bodies at the end of the day. Um, and the reason for that was it was not just because for fun, uh, Newton had been very, very successful. Newton's theory of gravity that I'm sure you're all perfectly aware of had been around for several hundreds of years and has been very successful. But already by the mid uh, 19th century, when instruments improved, um, astronomers recognized even within the solar system that there were some peculiarities, in particular in the motion of the planet Mercury that couldn't, re couldn't be explained um, by the relatively simple Newtonian description of gravity. And so Einstein's theory was a welcome extension of Newton's theory, and it gives us um, a lot of really exciting predictions, including gravitational waves. So let us briefly talk about and, you know, put these two theories into context and, you know, um, up against each other. So Newton's classic picture is, of course, that gravity is a force. In fact, it's an attractive force between any masses that you're considering. So me dropping my pen or the apple falling from the tree onto the surface of the earth is because of the gravitational attraction um, between the mass of the earth and the apple falling down. And in Newton's concept of gravity, time and space are absolute quantities and they are separate. They are not interwoven with each other. Uh, they are two independent concepts. And gravity itself, so the force of gravity, is mediated instantaneously. There's no time lag, so to say. And that is a very big difference in, in Einstein's theory of gravity, which is called general relativity. Now, the idea in general relativity is we no longer describe gravity as a force, but we describe it as a geometric property of what we call a four-dimensional space-time continuum. Now that sounds like really big words. So as opposed to Newton, where time and space are absolute, what we now have is we have time and space joined together to form a four-dimensional space-time. And they interact with each other. They are not separate entities, but they are interwoven with each other. If we now have um, objects in that space-time, or generally speaking, any type of energy, in the most simplest form, of course, some form of matter, then what this does, it, it deforms this continuum of space-time. And this is kind of illustrated in, in the graphic at the top here, where you can see in green a two-dimensional version of our four-dimensional space-time. Um, with a grid on it to illustrate the deformation. And then we see um, a massive object like here, the sun, and a less massive object like the earth. And what you can see here is near to the sun, there is clearly a dent in that fabric of space-time. And it's that dent that is very big, close to the object. And as we go further and further out, you can see the dent becomes less strong. So the curvature, that's the geometric property, that's what we call gravity. Um, the curvature of space-time is very strong, close to really compact and really heavy objects, but it becomes smaller and smaller further out. So in this regime where you don't have strong gravity acting, in fact, Newtonian gravity is most of the time an, a reasonable approximation. But when you go to objects that curve space-time quite significantly, you really start to see the discrepancies between the theories and you have to use general relativity to describe, for example, the motion of objects accurately. So in other words, this matter curves space-time and this, this curvature of space-time on the other hand tells matter how to move. 
And this is really fundamentally different in, in, in Einstein's gravity. And it has impacts for the motion of the planets, for the, the paths that light take, and of course, for gravitational waves. But even though that might seem a bit exotic and like, oh, but why, why do you need this sort of theory? I wanted to tell you that general relativity is actually also quite important for our everyday life. I think all of us are very used to using their phones, Google to, you know, type into where do you want to go and then get a path description and the time estimate of when they arrive somewhere. And in order for us to be able to do this, we use GPS, the global positioning system. And for this to be accurate, we really need to take general relativity into account. And this comes back again to this space and time being interwoven with each other, namely our uh, GPS satellites. They are in orbits around Earth that are about 20,000 kilometers um, above the Earth. And what we have is we have satellites that send essentially time signals to a receiver on Earth, as is kind of illustrated in this sketch here. Now, because the gravitational field is stronger close to the Earth than it is uh, further away from the Earth, time passes more slowly on the surface of the Earth than it does where the global positioning satellites are located at 20,000 kilometers above the Earth. And we have to take this time dilation into account to accurately um, translate this into positions on the Earth. Now, if you have these clocks out of sync, so if you don't take this into account, what would happen is in one day you would accumulate a time difference of about 17 milliseconds. Now that sounds like a very, very small thing, but it actually translates into a mispositioning of about five kilometers. And I don't think anybody of us would appreciate being sent five kilometers to the wrong place. So even though we don't necessarily need to use general relativity um, for many effects within the solar system, it does actually have quite a significant impact on our everyday life if you like to use your GPS on your phone or your car. But like any good theory, of course, um, general relativity makes very concrete predictions that we can test. It's really important when you have a theory that you go out and look for observational evidence to either verify or falsify your theory. And here I'd like to highlight uh, two really important uh, predictions of general relativity that were tested very, very early on and were a key part of the success subsequently of this theory. So the first one is the prediction of the deflection of flight, and that goes back to this picture of heavy masses making a dent in space-time. Let's consider a star very, very far away, and that star emits photons, and we have a telescope on Earth, and we want to measure the position of that star. If we assume Newtonian gravity, then this light, the light would travel along a straight path. But if we assume that Einstein's gravity is the correct theory, then we have around the sun in particular this big dent in the fabric. Now, if you have your light then traveling in this particular type of geometry, it would actually travel on a bent path. This is still the shortest path in this type of geometry, but it's not a straight line. It's the generalization of a straight line in the curved space time, and that's what we call the geodesic. And I mean, if you don't take this into account, then you would then to say, oh, my star is over there. You would obviously have a perceived position of the star that is in the wrong place. So you would have your star point being located in the, in the wrong place. Now, how do you measure that? And how was it verified? It was verified very early on in 1919 by the famous expedition by Eddington, where a solar eclipse happened. And you could use that um, to measure this deflection angle of light and compare it to the prediction of general relativity. And in fact, it was in excellent agreement, or as the New York Times liked to say at the time, that Einstein's theory triumphs. So this was one of the early successes of, of Einstein's theory, which was also met with some skepticism, of course, so you have to go and test the predictions. The second really crucial one is concerning the motion of one of our inner planets, the, the motion of Mercury. Mercury shows, orbit shows a peculiar behavior, namely something we call the perihelion precession. So as you know, and many of you probably have gone through Kepler's calculation, um, our orbit, our planets in the solar system, they move along ellipses um, around the sun. Now the point closest to the sun is what's called the perihelion. So every time it goes, you know, it goes around, it goes further out to the aphelion and then comes back in to the perihelion and passes it. 
Now, what was observed, and that was one of the peculiarities that was already observed around 1857, I believe, is that Newtonian, we observed that this perihelion moves. It's not in the same position if you keep observing the orbit of Mercury over many, many cycles. And Newtonian gravity per se does not predict that, though you can include some perturbation theory, for example, disturbers from other planets, so taking some n-body interactions into account, and you can account for a little bit of that motion, but you cannot, no matter what you do, get to the value that has actually been measured, which is about 43 arc seconds per century. However, if you take the equations of general relativity, um, with the details of Mercury, you get a prediction of about 43 arc seconds per century, and this is in excellent agreement with what has been measured, um, even with the latest, especially with the latest updated um, measurements uh, that have been produced. So Mercury shows that very clear deviation from the Newtonian prediction, and general relativity can, without any fudge factors, explain exactly the value that we measure. So these are really early successes. And they are really, really important. And these are tests in the solar system. So generally, even though I've visualized like the dent of the sun in the in the in the you know the fabric of space time, this is what we still call weak field. So for many of the solar system tests, actually, we can get away with just Newtonian gravity and slight perturbations to Newtonian gravity without having to go full on general relativity, except for some of these effects here, which this one is in particular due to the presence of an extended body here, which we don't have. In Newtonian gravity. But of course general relativity makes some more extreme predictions um, rather than just light bending and the perihelion precession. And I think one of the most fascinating one is of course the prediction of black holes, which I think probably all of you know last year um, won the Nobel Prize of course in physics. So what are black holes? Black holes are areas of space-time now that are so strongly curved that not even light can escape. And on this plot here it's, it's kind of illustrated in having this sort of extreme curvature uh, that you can see here on the right hand side. There are other objects um, that also dent space time quite heavily. The sun, very, very small, but then we have um, stars, certain types of stars, neutron stars, which we'll talk about more later on, that make a much bigger dent, but nothing quite as extreme as black holes. Now, black holes were first described already one year after the publication of general relativity, namely in 1916 by German astronomer Karl Schwarzschild. And um, if you are a theory aficionado, this is the simplest, the simplest solution, uh, one of the simplest solutions, I should say, to the rather complicated looking field equations of general relativity. Um, but you make symmetry assumption, et voila, you get the solution of Schwarzschild that describes um, a space-time outside a spherical distribution. Black holes are also very simple um, in, in terms of how we describe them. They're essentially described by two parameters, the mass of the black hole and the spin. So the spin tells you how fast and in what direction around which axis your black hole is rotating. In principle, there's a third parameter. They could also have electric charge, but for astrophysical black holes, so the ones we'll be talking about today, we believe generally that they are charge neutral. So they don't have a residual plus or minus charge related to them. And how do they form? For the astrophysical black holes that span a range of about, you know, a few times the mass of the sun to maybe a few hundred times the mass of the sun, uh, sorry, a few ten times the mass of the sun, we believe that they are formed at the end of the life of massive stars. So, you know, stars support themselves against their own gravity um, through pressure from the core, which they which they produce a few fusion processes on the inside, but at some point they're running out of fusion material, so they can no longer generate this pressure, and then the star starts to collapse onto itself. And if the star initially was heavy enough, then the, um, the self-gravity will be so strong that it will form a black hole under its own collapse. And these will be most of the, the black holes we'll be talking about. Of course, there's other types of black holes. Here you can see the first image of a black hole that was published um, last year, I believe, by the um, Event Horizon Telescope collaboration, um, where we're here talking about M87. So that's a, a galaxy. So we're talking here about a supermassive black hole, so a very different mass scale. We're talking here about millions to billions times the mass of the sun and how these are formed, well, that's still up to speculation. We could also think about primordial black holes, so very small black holes, and that may have formed in the very early universe shortly after the Big Bang. But for today, we will be focusing mostly on the astrophysical black holes. 
So how do we actually observe black holes? I mean, apart from gravitational waves, there are, of course, black holes. We have been talking about observing black holes for, for many, many decades. And the main reason for that is we can indirectly postulate the presence of a black hole. Now, this is not a direct evidence, and this is not a direct measurement of the properties of the black hole, because, you know, black holes, they are black because light doesn't escape, so pointing your telescope doesn't really get you anywhere. But you can deduce information actually with electromagnetic observations by looking at the influence that black holes have on their surrounding objects, such as stars or matter. And that will cause uh, specific observations in the electromagnetic spectrum. And you can use those then to infer something about the properties of that object that is sitting there that we're not seeing, but is clearly influencing its environment. Now here, I'll show you a little video I hope this works. I hope you can see that. Um, that is a video by the uh, UCLA group uh, around uh, Andrea Guess, who also got the Nobel Prize uh, in, in physics um, for the black hole discovery last year. And so what you can see here is the motion of stars that have been observed for a long, long period. I believe they have been observed for more than 15 years. And in particular, look at this yellow closed curve. So there's an entire orbit that has been um, observed. And here we see a zoom in, this is S02. And that's an orbit of a star. And that stars, all these stars, as we have seen, they are orbiting around some center of gravity. But there's nothing there when you point your electromagnetic telescope. There's nothing in that center that could be the center of gravity. And so the only, I mean, the only plausible explanation, let's put it that way, that we have so far is that this is um, a, a supermassive black hole that's sitting there in the center of galaxy and clearly influencing through its gravitational interaction the motion of the stars around it. And by having an entire orbit, you can very nicely estimate the mass um, of the, the central black hole that is required in order to explain the motion of the stars. Now, alternatively, you might want to look at accretion. So either having a star being disrupted when it comes too close to the black hole and get ripped apart, then that will cause flashes and flares that you can observe. Or you just have a much larger accretion disk where the matter falls within the tidal radius of the black hole and accretes onto the black hole, creating again radiation and possibly even a jet-like structure with very high energetic electromagnetic radiation. So this is all indirect evidence. For, for black holes. So how can we go about potentially observing directly the black hole without having to rely on any support from electromagnetic radiation? Well, Einstein's theory of gravity predicts something um, else that Newtonian gravity does not predict. And I really want to stress this, and that's gravitational waves. So gravitational waves are periodic vibrations of the fabric of space-time. And these vibrations travel at the speed of light, according to Einstein, and they are generated by all accelerating masses. So if you're familiar with electromagnetism, you might recall that electromagnetic radiation is created by accelerating charges. So in gravity, we have a sort of analog. We're replacing the charge with mass. So accelerate, any accelerated mass will generate gravitational waves. But they're very, very tiny because the fabric of space-time is actually very stiff. So it's very difficult to actually deform space-time through the gravitational interaction. So how can we think about gravitational waves? There's a nice animation here by Cal Rodriguez where you can again see a central object that has a big dent and then we have a smaller object and they are bound to each other in orbit just like our planets go around in the solar system. And what you can see though is that the fabric of space-time is being distorted through this motion. So the motion in a circle is an accelerated motion of course and we can see that this causes the generation of gravitational waves. And you can see that they're traveling outwards, very similar to the type of waves you would see when you drop a stone in a pond, for example, as is kind of sketched in the image, in the image up here. Now, what is not shown here, when you generate gravitational waves, you're extracting energy from the orbit. So what happens is actually, uh, after enough energy has been extracted, that blue object will come closer and closer to the orange one and at some point plunge into it and they will create a single object at the very end. Now, if you have a single black hole, it will not do that. But if you get two black holes in orbit around each other, then gravitational waves are your best bet of actually, you know, observing black holes, not in the electromagnetic spectrum, obviously, but directly through the gravitational waves that they generate 
when they abound in orbit. And that provides us with a really unique means to study black holes and also neutron stars. Now, what creates um, gravitational waves? Similar to you know, electromagnetic radiation, gravitational waves come across a whole spectrum. They don't just, they are not just emitted in a single frequency bin, but we have a whole spectrum of frequencies that we can observe gravitational waves in. And this is kind of illustrated here, and the, the, the rainbow colors are guiding your eyes, very similar to how you would do it in the electromagnetic. So if you look at the tip of the arrow here, here we are in what is the high frequency range. So here we're talking about gravitational wave periods of milliseconds and gravitational wave frequencies between a few tens of hertz and kilohertz. And the sources that generate gravitational waves in that regime are neutron stars and stellar mass black holes that are close to their merger. So they are already very, very close to each other such that the gravitational waves that they emit will have these frequencies. Other sources in that regime are supernovae explosions. So I mentioned earlier when stars at the end of the life stop um, burning, uh, stop fusing elements and stop hydrogen burning and then start to collapse, what you actually have, you also have a supernova, so an outward shock wave that is being sent uh, and creates these beautiful nebulae uh, that you can see in these, in these multicolor pictures. Um, and these would also create gravitational waves um, in that regime. And then also if you have isolated neutron stars that are spinning and have a mountain on them, so they're not perfectly symmetric, then this would also create gravitational waves in that frequency regime. But we are not limited to that regime. There are other sources that will generate gravitational waves at much lower frequencies. For example, in the millihertz regime, there is what is called extreme mass ratio in spiral. So you can think about a star or a smaller stellar mass black hole, so you know, tens of solar masses plunging into a supermassive black hole at the center of a galaxy, for example. And if we go even further down to about the nanohertz regime, so 10 to the minus nine, um, hertz here, then we also see actual supermassive black holes, or we, we would be seeing the gravitational waves from supermassive black hole binaries, I should say. So for example, you can think about them if you have the merger of two galaxies. Sometime in the future, the Milky Way is going to collide with Andromeda. We both have central black holes, so these might form a binary system. And then very similar to the um, cosmic microwave background from uh, the Big Bang, we also expect that there's actually a stochastic background, so a superposition of many, many unresolved sources of gravitational waves across the entire spectrum um, from, you know, the early universe through processes in the early universe that have generated gravitational waves. So there's a lot of excitement, and what we have observed to date is really because of the detectors we have restricted to the high frequency regime, so keep that in mind for the rest of the talk. Gravitational waves, obviously predicted, were actually first indirectly detected already in the 1970s. And that was through the famous binary star system PSR 1916 plus 13, which is what is known as the Hulse Taylor binary pulsar. Um, so uh, this is not a black hole system, but it's a system that consists of a neutron star and a pulsar. So a pulsar is a neutron star with a very strong magnetic field. And when you have a very strong magnetic field, you get collimated synchrotron emission along the field lines of the magnetic field. And every time your line of sight passes, essentially this pulsar beam, you can measure obviously the position of the pulsar as it goes around the neutron star. And over the years, over many, many years, here you can see a plot that goes up to 2005, um, the position of the, the, you know, the period of the star or the shift in the period, so how the period when you measure the next pulse has changed, has been measured very, very accurately. These are the black dots you can see here. And then in, in the black line underneath, you can see the prediction from general relativity and the assumption that this is a binary system that emits gravitational waves, because that's what GR tells us. If you have such a binary system, it should create generate gravitational waves, and that will cause the orbit to shrink due to the loss of the energy. And indeed, I mean, the agreement is absolutely fabulous, and it fully deservedly, of course, received also the Nobel Prize. But what about direct detection? And how can we actually learn about black holes from gravitational waves? We can learn about them by recognizing what the effect of gravitational waves is actually. And the effect on space-time, as was kind of illustrated in this little video, is that you have stretching and squeezing in perpendicular direction. And I've kind of sketched this here with like a little 
uh, essentially a 2D ruler. So we have two directions, um, you know, one along the red arrow and then one perpendicular. And if you now have a gravitational wave traveling into, into the screen that you're looking at, then what would happen is it would squeeze in one direction and stretch in the other direction and vice versa. Or you can also think about it here as a ring of particles and to have the squeezing illustrated in that way. And is that characteristic stretching and squeezing of the gravitational wave that we use to build our observatories and actually detect gravitational waves. Now, how large is that effect? It is very, very, very small. So here, a human hair, the average human hair has a, has a diameter of about 0.1 millimeters. The size of an atom, on the other hand, is about 1 million times smaller than the diameter of the hair, or in physical units, that's 10 to the minus 10 meters. Now, the atomic nucleus, so a proton, is another 100,000 times smaller than that. So we're talking here 10 to the minus 15 meter, just so you get a scale. On average, even in the most cataclysmic events in the universe that create really strong gravitational waves, this relative length change that is induced through the stretching and squeezing when the gravitational wave passes, which we call the strain, is, so the length change is on the order of 10 to the minus 18 meters. So that's another thousand times smaller than the size of a proton. So just to give you a feeling for how tiny that effect is, even if you have something like two black holes clashing into each other. And in order to build such a tiny, tiny, tiny change in length, we really need to build some of the most precise rulers that have ever been built. And these rulers are interferometers. So many of you well, probably have come across a Michelson interferometer before, uh, became really famous in the quest to understand whether, you know, the speed of light is a universal uh, constant or not, or depends on the direction. So this was the frame of hand for the ether. And we use a very similar, essentially the identical concept, a bit more fancified these days, of course, but the basic idea is exactly the same. We have a light source, a monochromatic light source, uh, a laser, we have a beam splitter, and then we have two arms in the interferometer at an angle of 45 degrees to each other, where at the end of each arm we have a mirror. And then we have a photodiode to collect the output, as you would do. And here's an illustration and a nice video of how this works. So we have the laser light go through, get reflected, recombine, and be read out. Now we have the gravitational wave passing, and it stretches and squeezes space-time. So practically it changes the length in one arm to the interferometer keeping the other arm fixed and then vice versa as it goes through in a periodic motion. And this you know, relative change between the two arms leads to a characteristic interference pattern of your recombined laser light. And that's nicely illustrated here. So you can see when the gravitational wave now goes through, it changes the, the travel time that the photons take before they can recombine. And this gives us this interference pattern at our readout port. And it will change according to the gravitational wave and the gravitational wave in turn will carry all the information about the source that we are interested in measuring. Here you have an actual look inside some of the LIGO detectors. Uh, so they are in very, very long light tubes. So the LIGO detectors are four kilometers long. These are high vacuum tubes where our laser light travels down four kilometers. Here you can see an image of the mirrors. These are some of the most polished mirrors that have ever been built. About only one in three million photons gets absorbed. So they're incredibly highly reflective and very, very precise measurements as we need in order to measure something of a change of about 10 to the minus 18 meters. Um, our current observ observatory network consists of the two LIGO detectors in the United States, one in Louisiana here and another one in Hanford in a former nuclear testing site. I shall say both of them four kilometers long. The other uh, comparable one is uh, Virgo, just outside Pisa in Italy, with an arm length of about three kilometers. And these um, detectors together observe gravitational waves with a frequency between about 10, 20 hertz and up to about 2 kilohertz. We also have a smaller facility in Germany outside Hanover, that's Geo 600, with an arm length of about 600 meters. And that is predominantly used as a, 
as an R&D testing facility to develop new technologies that then gets implemented into the larger observatories. Since last year, we also have an observatory operating in Japan in uh, the Kamioka mine, the famous Kamioka mine, where you also have some of the neutrino experiments like Super Kamiokande. And in the coming years, we anticipate a detector to come online also in India. And there's also interest for further detectors potentially in China and also in Australia. So we'll see what the future holds. Um, but this is just to let you know, this is really a global network. And there are many, many thousands of scientists involved in it. And the University of Birmingham, I'm proud to say, is one of the UK centers for gravitational wave research. And we have a long history and a strong involvement in the first discovery and also in the current running of the detectors. And now that you know how we can detect gravitational waves and what they, what they are, we waited 100 years, roughly, until the first detection. And this was a, a wonderful surprise when, after some upgrades from the initial configuration to the advanced configuration of the detectors, we literally turned them on and whoop, there it was the very first direct detection of gravitational waves on the 14th of September in 2015, when LIGO, the two LIGO detectors were the only ones operating at the time, detected the collision of two black holes. And we dubbed this event GW15 or 914. And this is what it looked like. So what have you just seen and heard? So what we're looking at here is actually um, a spectrogram. So a spectrogram is a time frequency diagram of the data in the two detectors. So at the top here in orange, we have LIGO Hanford, and at the bottom here, we have LIGO Livingston. And what you heard in two different uh, frequency ranges was the detector data and the gravitational wave signal. It was just upsampled to be um, audible to our ears. So at the beginning, you heard a lot of rumbling going on. People who might remember analog TVs might remember the white noise from the good old days. But on top of that, I hope that those of you who were able to hear it did hear a whoop, a little sort of pop coming up um, out of that, that noise. And that is the characteristic sound of a gravitational wave. It's what we call a chirp signal because it has this chirping up in frequency. And that's also what you can see here in this time frequency spectrogram. So you can see as time goes on, the frequency rises. So we're going here from about 30 hertz all the way to more than, you know, roughly speaking, 300 hertz here. On top of that here, we also show you the actual gravitational wave. And we'll look at that a little bit more closely in a second. But this was a big, you know, a big discovery. It was a, a beautiful surprise. Um, and in particular, the expectation was actually that we will observe a neutron star first and that we had two black holes. That was a really big surprise. And on top of that, it all agrees incredibly well with the predictions of general relativity. So how do we know that this was a binary black hole merger? It's all in the gravitational wave, and that's the beauty of it. So here you can see a theoretical prediction of the gravitational wave signal of two black holes. Um, and it might look a little bit unspectacular, it looks just like a regular kind of wave, um, but it carries so much information and that why, that's why it's so beautiful. So I'd like to draw your attention to three parts of this, of this curve here. So at the beginning here, our two black holes are quite far apart. And we have, you know, we see this nice period that looks almost constant. It's not really changing. Um, you know, if you had dots here, the troughs and the peaks would be occurring at a nice periodic change. But we're emitting gravitational wave. Remember, we're extracting energy from the orbit. So what that causes is it causes the orbit to shrink. Now, when the orbit shrinks, they have to speed up. The consequence for the gravitational wave is that the period is going to change. They're chirping up. So you can see that the peaks and the troughs are now moving closer and closer together in comparison to what happened earlier on. And ultimately, they will be so close that the two black holes effectively collide with each other. They melt into one black hole. That's what general relativity predicts. Initially, this one black hole is still quite shaken from this violent merger with another black hole, but it sheds itself of these perturbations, essentially to reach a minimum energy state. It gets rid of this. This is what we call the ring down, really like you can think about it like a bell ringing, and it's ringing down until it reaches its quiescent state, and that's it. That's the end of the gravitational wave. 
So if we didn't have the binary, you know, we didn't have a direct signature from the two black holes because they go back into once 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 you have a single black hole, it goes back into the quiescent state and it disappears. And you know, you might see it again when it meets another black hole and forms another merger system. But that is really that is the trace, that is the DNA or the fingerprint. And from it, you can really extract the properties of the black hole. You can tell how heavy the black holes were. You can tell how fast they were spinning. And that is really amazing. Um, but it requires us to have incredibly accurate signal predictions. And this is not a trivial thing. Um, the field equations or, you know, the, the main equations that you need to solve to describe this in general relativity are very complicated. It's, it's very difficult to solve them with pen and paper. And um, well, the Schwarzschild solution is one of the few that you can actually do with pen and paper. But if you go to a more complex system, like having two black holes, um, you can't you can't really write the full solution down with pen and paper. You can write down an approximate solution here in the in-spiral part, so when the two black holes are still quite widely separated. But this approximation method, by the nature of the equations, is going to break down when the two black holes come too close to each other. And then what you really need to do is you need to solve the equations numerically. So we use big supercomputers and thousands of CPU hours uh, to actually simulate how the gravitational wave signal for these black holes looks like across, you know, the parameter space of mass ratios and spins that we, you know, that 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 are predicted essentially or are in agreement with general relativity in order for us to be able to then compare it to the data and ultimately say, yeah, this was this black hole in this position in the sky, it was that heavy and it spun that fast. So that's really, really a key ingredient for us to be able to make these inferences. And here you can see the agreement between the data or well, the first detection TW159.14 and the theoretical prediction. And they agree extremely well. And that is, that is one of the strongest confirmations of general relativity, in particular in a regime really deep in the potential well that we haven't been able to probe general relativity before. And this is so important because, as you, as you probably know, we're still hunting for a unification between quantum mechanics and gravity. So we know that GR is not general relativity, is not the final answer. Um, to have this full picture. We know that at some energy scale, it will need some form of modification in order to be compatible with quantum mechanics. But in this regime here, it agrees incredibly well, and there's no need to think about an alternative to Einstein's predictions here. So this wiggle, this tiny wiggle, tells us that this GW150914 merger consisted of two black holes that were about 36 and 29 times as massive as our own sun. They collided about a billion years ago. So even though we measured it in 2015, the actual merger happened a long, long time before even multicellular life evolved on Earth. I can also tell you just from this tiny wiggle and you know the comparison to the prediction from GR and its incredibly good agreement that the radius of the final black hole was about 180 kilometers and the mass about 65 solar masses. And this is really, I mean, I think this is really extraordinary from just this tiny, tiny, tiny change that we have seen and that these instruments were able to deduce from, um, you know, the distortion of space-time. Since then, a lot has happened. Um, in just two years, between 2015 and 2017, actually LIGO and Virgo joined and they observed uh, a total of uh, 10 binary black holes, which you can see in blue here. So we're looking here at the masses um, of the black holes that we measured during these two years. In purple, if I draw your attention to the purple black holes first, these are what we call EM black holes. So that goes back to the very beginning. These were these kinds of black holes that whose masses we inferred indirectly through the interaction with you know, a, a companion star in particular, where mass transfer from the star onto the black hole was happening. But in blue, these are the LIGO Virgo black holes that have been observed. And what's already kind of striking is the mass spectrum, the mass range that we're looking at, right? If you were to truncate it here at where the, the purple ones end, we would be at around, you know, 20, a few, you know, 20 times the mass of our sun. But it's clear that we are probing black holes that we have never seen before. They're significantly heavier um, than the black holes that were inferred 
you know, from the observation of electromagnetic um, binary systems. And so this is, this is really exciting. So we're starting to populate and really kind of identify ID, map out the demographics of stellar mass black holes out there in the universe. And of course, the detection of gravitational waves was honored with the Nobel Prize in 2017. A lot has happened since then. So in fact, it's like a big collaboration and like a month ago, we published the latest data set. And today they have observed on the order of 85 to 90 binary black holes. And you can see the mass range has even further expanded. There have been observations of black holes that are now a few hundred times the mass of our sun, but also some that seem to be incredibly light. And in particular, very, very light, even lighter than some that have been observed electromagnetically before. And this is very exciting because it could tell us about, you know, the environments where these black hole forms, the history, are they really directly coming from a stellar collapse or did they form through a previous merger of black holes, for example. This is, this is really, really exciting stuff that's happening at the moment. And our sample size is now increasing significantly. And, you know, we expect this to be extended to several hundreds of observations just within the next few years. I would like to highlight uh, a few of the exciting binary black holes that we have seen in particular in, in the most recent observing run that the detectors did. So the first one is GW190521 which was a particularly heavy merger between an 85 and a 66 solar mass black hole. So two really, really big black holes. And they created a black hole in the end that was 142 solar masses heavy. And this is really, really exciting. So here you can see a range of masses in this plot at the bottom here for a number of gravitational wave binary events that have been observed. And then here on the side, you can see 1905-21. And it's already, you know, sticks out significantly in term of, terms of the mass, already the individual ones, but in particular, the final black hole that is formed in the end. And it sits in a, in a, in a mass range, which we call intermediate mass black holes. Intermediate mass black holes are black holes that are about 100 times the mass of the sun to, you know, um, a few a thousand times the mass of the sun. And they are particularly exciting because they are postulated to exist. And there has actually been, um, um, you know, there have been observations where people said, we, we think there is an intermediate mass black hole, again, indirectly through uh, electromagnetic observation. But over the years, these have gone away. They have disappeared. Um, you know, people were disappointed by that. And now with this detection, there is now a first very, very clear detection of an intermediate mass black hole. So yes, these black holes a few hundred times the mass of our sun, they do indeed exist. And they form, in parts at least, through the mergers of heavy black holes, which is also very exciting to know. There's a second event I would like um, to draw your attention to in this big blob, <laughs> which was GW 1908-14. Um, and that was also rather peculiar. So this event uh, is also a binary merger. We've only observed binary mergers to date. And it was the merger of a 20 solar mass black hole with, yeah, and that's the big question mark. Because the mass of the secondary object as measured from the gravitational wave had about a median mass of about 2.6 solar masses. Now you might say, what, 2.6 solar masses? Why, why is that a problem? Well, it is peculiar because it is heavier um, than the, you know, it is, it is heavier than the heaviest known neutron star and is lighter than the lightest known black hole. <laughs> so it sits somewhere in between. And from a formation perspective, it is, it is a very interesting question because we have not observed black holes in that low mass range. So we have not observed black holes confidently below five solar masses. And we have not confidently observed neutron stars beyond the mass of 2.5 solar masses. So it is very interesting to, you know, understand what the nature of this object is. And we were not able from the gravitational wave alone to, you know, fully deduce this is the definitive answer to this. So it's still up to speculation and hopefully in the future there will be more of these exciting uh, observations that lead us, you know, to some, some questions um, that need to be asked and spark obviously a lot of new research. So to finish up the black hole section, what we have learned so far from these uh, really exciting observations is, of course, that 
black holes do exist. We have direct evidence. We do not rely on some electromagnetic observation and indirect inference of the existence of the black hole, but we have seen gravitational waves from black holes merging with each other in perfect agreement with general relativity. And that's another key point. On that energy scale, general relativity seems to be really the correct theory of gravity. And of course, people are just waiting for it to break down at some point with some observation. We've also seen a black hole span a really wide range of masses, masses that we haven't directly observed before and not even inferred from electromagnetic observations of stellar mass binaries before. So this is also really exciting because we're starting to learn about the demographics of the black holes, the distribution of the black holes, and ultimately also the formation history of these black holes throughout the history of the universe. And, you know, we want to ask ourselves, how do they influence the evolution of the universe? And how do they contribute to the environment and shape the environment in particular? And we have also learned that some of the black holes have spin, some don't. And that could also lead us to some better understanding about uh, the types of environments and what sort of black holes might prefer being created in this environment or that environment. So it's been a really exciting journey on the black hole side of things, but that's, that's only the beginning. And black holes weren't the only things we have observed. Um, but I think now is a good time, Scott, uh, to let uh, our interpreter catch up. Yes, thank you, Patricia. That's been fascinating. And actually, thank you to everybody who's typed some questions in. It looks like we'll have a fair few towards the end, which will be great. So for those that are new to the Keel Physics Centre, uh, we do have a short interlude during the talk, uh, A, to allow Steve and our interpreter a short break, um, but also to allow those of us to go and refill our glasses or use the loo as we see fit. So according to my clock, and uh, I can't say if it is or it isn't in sync, go back to Patricia's first slides, whether it's in sync with satellites or not, but my old fashioned analog watch says 1953. Uh, we'll give it three minutes. So we'll look to come back at 1956. So please feel free to go away and fill your glasses. Um, if you are suitably um, refreshed, please feel free to post a question in the chat function. And I'll be sure to ask uh, those questions to Dr. Schmidt at the end of the talk. So um, thank you very much for your attention so far. We'll see you again very shortly. Can I? Thank you. Thank you, team. Uh, thank you to David, Kevin, John, Rob. Uh, some excellent questions, Dominic. So, Patricia, you will be busy, I think, in the Q&A at the end, but that's fantastic. Some excellent questions. I've tried to note them as best I can, um, and we will answer those at the end of the talk. But it's uh, incredibly interesting. I'm going to hand straight back to Patricia. Back to you, Patricia. Brilliant. Thank you very much. I'm slower than I anticipated, so let's dive right in. Um, which is, it was not all about black holes. Black holes are brilliant and they're wonderful, um, but there's other exciting stuff out there that creates gravitational waves and that we can use to do some really exciting science with. And on the 17th of August in 2017, a different kind of gravitational wave was observed, namely the first gravitational wave that came from two colliding neutron stars, GW170817. And here you can again see the spectrogram so the time frequency plane, and in the first two, at least for LIGO Hanford and LIGO Livingston, you hopefully when you squint, you can see the gravitational wave chirp. Now that looks very, very different to the chirp we have seen before from the black holes that were about 30 solar masses each. So here we're talking about really, really low mass objects and that why they have this really, really long signal. You can see here more than 30 seconds are shown here. And it chirp up very, very, very slowly. But at the end, of course, again, reaching almost the speed of light, becoming very close to each other, we can see the chirp up at the very end quite significantly. And it is really that characteristic of the signal that's telling us, among other things, that this is a neutron star binary. But what's particularly exciting, and I think the whole community went a bit crazy over it, is um, that it was accompanied by electromagnetic radiation across the entire spectrum. The first one up was 1.7 seconds after the gravitational wave was detected, NASA's Fermi satellite registered gamma rays, hard gamma rays, and that's kind of nicely shown in this here. I, I really like that animation, it's so nice. You could again hear uh, the chirp, you know, 
uh, from the from the gravitational wave signal here, the very last few seconds of the gravitational wave chirp within the sensitivity band of the LIGO detectors, and then 1.7 seconds kind of illustrating here how the photodetector at the Fermi satellite received that um, very hard gamma ray photons. And this was particularly exciting because the merger of two neutron stars has been postulated for a long, long time to be the cause of short gamma ray bursts. So these hard gamma ray bursts, they have been observed many, many tens of them for many years. And it, it you know, we anticipated that these are created by the collisions of either two neutron stars or a neutron star with a, a quite light stellar mass black hole, but there hasn't been any conclusive evidence until this incredible coincident observation between the gamma ray and the gravitational wave signal. But it's not just the gamma rays. In fact, this um, event was observed across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. And I believe I read the other day somewhere that it is the most observed object in, you know, in, in, in the optical um, in the universe. And here you can see another video that shows you what happens electromagnetically, so to say, in the aftermath of such a collision of two neutron stars. So we have the two neutron stars as they orbit around each other, emitting gravitational waves, shrinking the orbit, coming closer and closer, violently merging. And this is much more complicated scenario than with black holes, because you've got all this matter from the neutron star that is there. And you can see it creates all sorts of interesting phenomena, a jet structure, um, matter that hits the interstellar medium in a shock wave, um, an accretion disk around the central object that is being formed, which could either be a neutron star or a black hole, depending on how massive the new neutron stars were in the first place. And from that electromagnetic observations across all of the spectrum, we can learn a huge amount of information about these events. So here is a, a sketch or a schematic of um, kind of the aftermath scenario of the, the collision of two neutron stars, where we have here the launch of the gamma ray through um, a jet structure, but then also we have what is called the kilonova, which is the ejected material that goes out in the collision and then hits the interstellar medium and will initially radiate in the optical and then later on in the radio for synchrotron emission. Now, what's really interesting here, this is all powered by, we have the neutron stars, neutron rich matter here, and it will start to create new elements. There will be fusion processes going on and radioactive decay. And this is what powers this extremely bright aftermath of the merger. And it's observable across the whole spectrum. So from you know the infrared to the optical to the UV, and we can learn a lot about the energetics after the merger. So how this material is being injected, what the geometry is of how the material is injected, et cetera. And that allows us to learn about you know, the environment, um, the stellar population that you know, creates these sort of observations, the formation scenarios. But what's also particularly exciting is it allows us, when we have an electromagnetic counterpart, we can, of course, infer the distance or the redshift of the source of the host galaxy where this collision has happened. And this allows us then, together with the gravitational wave signal, to have an independent measurement of the Hubble parameter. And if you have been reading the news recently, um, there is the famous Hubble tension between the late time and the early time universe observations. And it has recently, last week, in fact, been pushed to now being a five sigma tension. So something really, really um, seems to be going on there. And gravitational wave observations could provide um, you know, an alternative, a completely independent route. And not right now, but maybe in the future with many more observations, help to uh, inform this tension, which would be rather interesting. We've also learned, especially when you have this, this kilonova going out there, that uh, many of the precious metals like gold and platinum were are created in these collisions of merging neutron stars. So again, this was an expectation. Um, and given the abundances, there needed to be another host, so to say, a, a, a place where these are being created. And with this observation, it was definitely confirmed that merging neutron stars play a significant role um, as, as you know, birthplaces of these uh, precious elements. So I've talked about neutron stars, but I've actually talked about neutron stars. So, so what are neutron stars actually? So they, they are also end products of dying stars. So similar to black holes, but they're created when your initial star isn't heavy enough to actually form a black hole at the end. So they are less massive 
And when they collapse, they don't collapse fully into a black hole, but they actually create a neutron star. So neutron stars in the simplest picture you have is just a very dense star that essentially consists in the core of degenerate neutrons. These are some of the densest known objects in the universe. And many of them have been observed, thousands of them actually, um, when you observe you know, the remnants of, of supernova explosions where a neutron star has been created, when we observe pulsars. So they are very, very well studied in principle and we have a large sample size. But to this date, we don't really know what neutron stars are really made of because they're so dense, there could be some interesting stuff going on in the inside of the neutron stars. And gravitational waves could help us uh, inform that. And how is that? So here you have a, a picture of the QCD phase diagram. So you have the baryon, you have temperature as a function of baryon density. So here, neutron density, you can think of. And neutron star mergers, the, the things that we observe in gravitational waves, they sit in a very special place in this diagram, namely at very, very high baryon densities. So, you know, the densities are really extreme when, when you have this compression at the end of the life of the star, but they're also actually very low in temperature. So they sit at a very different spectrum to, for example, the areas you can probe when you go to the LHC at CERN and look at, at heavy ion collisions where you have very high temperatures, for example, and relatively low densities in comparison to what we expect to be in the neutron stars themselves. So neutron stars are kind of these really extreme cosmic laboratories um, for particle physics, which is really exciting, I think. So it is believed, if you talk to the theorists, um, that neutron stars consist of several layers of an outer crust, um, quite thin, and then an inner crust that is a few kilometers thick. And then they have this core. At the core, you have several times the uh, supernuclear saturation density. But what exactly sits in the core? Yeah, that is a big question. Um, is it superfluid neutrons? Could there be some superconduction going on? Could there be maybe be some, some new types of particles like hyperons? Could there be actually a deconfined quark state? We don't know. And, you know, we, we can't just go up to a neutron star and look inside, right? So we have to find other means uh, to study them. And gravitational waves are one of the ways uh, we can do that. And the reason for that is because neutron stars, they are made of matter. They're very different in their characteristic to black holes. And that also means that the gravitational wave signal looks characteristically different. Binary neutron stars, so neutron stars in a binary system are subjected to tidal forces. So if you start with a spherically symmetric star and you place it in the gravitational field of a companion, then it feels this companion and the side, you know, that's looking towards the other star gets, of course, deformed. This is very similar to the interaction we have between the sun and the moon, just a bit more extreme, between the Earth and the moon, just much more extreme, of course, because we are in a much deeper potential well here. And this tidal interaction changes the morphology of the gravitational wave signal. So initially, when they're very far apart, the signal is barely distinguishable from what you would get from black holes with the same mass. But as they come closer and closer together, this tidal interaction gets stronger. And so you're taking more energy out to deform the star. So you're generating gravitational waves and you're deforming the star now. So you're effectively speeding up the in spiral and causing the, black, the two neutron stars to merge significantly earlier. And what happens afterwards is rather complicated. And as I said before, there's multiple different outcomes depending on how massive your initial neutron stars were. And it's this tiny, tiny difference in the gravitational wave that allows us to learn about the composition of the neutron star. Because depending on you know, um, what a star is actually made of, this signature will look different. And it's a, it's a very, very tiny effect um, but with sensitive enough instruments, we can deduce very significant information. And that's really important because it tells us essentially if, you know, if all neutron stars are the same, it will tell us what the radius of the neutron star is, which is something that is very, very difficult to measure from electromagnetic observations. So this was super exciting, lots of black holes, very exciting collisions of neutron stars, and of course the whole electromagnetic spectrum observed with it. Um, and we hope for many more of these exciting discoveries. So right now, LIGO and Virgo and Cabra um, are undergoing some upgrades, and we plan to start observing again next year, at the end of next year, in December 2022. And of course we hope to see more binary neutron star mergers, more binary black hole mergers, and also, you know, mergers between neutron stars and black hole, which also have been observed, but I didn't get a chance to talk about. And then, of course, what's really exciting about any form of research, you hope for new classes of gravitational wave sources. Maybe there's a supernova explosion. 
maybe Beetlejuice, you know, changes his mind and actually goes supernova. That would be really exciting. And of course, the big surprises, the unknowns. So that's always very exciting. Things that make us scratch our hats and give us puzzles and riddles to solve. Looking further ahead into the 2030s, what's the, you know, what's the future of gravitational wave observations? So there are now concrete plans for the next generation of ground-based observatories with much more improved sensitivity. And that will allow us to observe black holes and neutron stars to much further distances. So looking much further back in time and really being able to learn about the formation history as a function of redshift. So, you know, maybe at very early times, the black holes were all quite low mass, who knows? Um, but these observations will be able to tell us that which will be very, very exciting. And complementary to that, there's also a planned um, space-based mission by ESA and NASA, uh, the famous LISA mission, hopefully also going to launch about 2037, which is a triangular configuration. So a very, very large triangular shaped um, interferometer in space trailing Earth's orbit with an arm length of about 2.5 million kilometers. That was the latest study the science study. And this will allow us with these very long arm lengths to look at much lower gravitational wave frequencies um, in space. And so you can see here with, uh, you know, the, the types of gravitational waves we expect, the typical characteristic strain that they induce as a function of frequency. So very similar to the spectrum plot before, but just showing you here in the high frequency regimes with the next generation of ground-based detectors, just significantly more sensitive here, which will allow us to measure the properties even much more precisely than we do today. And then with LISA here looking really at the millihertz regime, where we'll have these extreme mass ratio in spiral and, and massive binaries, so tens of thousands of solar masses, because that's the frequency regime where they like to merge. And going even further down in frequency in the nanohertz regime, um, we can't build an interferometer because we would have to have really extremely even longer arms, obviously, than LISA. We can use pulsars um, essentially as clocks to measure gravitational waves, and that's what the pulsar timing array is doing, and that will hopefully um, make a confirmed detection of the predicted stochastic gravitational wave background um, from the early universe. So I think I've run massively over, but if you allow me to just conclude, Gravitational wave astronomy is a really young field, actually, in practice. It's only six years old, but it's given us many, many new insights into nature. You know, among other things, black holes really do exist, and they come in very, very many different shapes and sizes. Um, they agree, to date at least, practically extremely well with the predictions of Einstein. And we've also seen other events, such as the binary neutron stars, which create some of the most uh, energetic phenomena uh, in the universe and create some of the precious elements um, that we all like to have jewelry. Christmas is coming up, right? And so it's been, it's been a tremendous journey, but it's really only the beginning. And, you know, with improved sensitivity, we will be able to measure, you know, the characteristics of the black holes and the neutron stars ever more precisely and they will observe we will resume observations hopefully at the end of next year and we anticipate many tens and hundreds of observations in the coming years so i hope you are a little bit excited at least now um, because the future will be extremely bright and extremely loud and um, i hope you will keep listening to the universe so thank you very much Thank you very much, Patricia. If you were in person at Keele, I'm sure you'd be listening now to a rapturous applause. But unfortunately, by Zoom with everybody's mics muted, we can't give you that. So it'll have to be the uh, the sound of silence. But it has been fantastic. And, and I think that's testament to the fact that we've got so many questions. So um, I will try and get through as many as we can. Um, but I am conscious of the time. Um, I'm going to indulge myself to begin with, Patricia, which I can do often as the host. Um, um, you mentioned right at the start when you... Um, talked about LIGO that it was highly reflective the mirrors were highly reflective um now I've got images of my dear past Nan going in with a bottle of pledge and a duster to keep it reflective and you know shiny but obviously that doesn't happen so how do you maintain the reflective nature of the mirrors over the course of time yeah so I'm, I mean I'm I'm not an experimentalist so <laughs> take it with a pinch of salt but my understanding is that um 
you know, they are they are submersed in a vacuum, right, in an extreme vacuum. So they're really conscious of not having any dust come into the vacuum chambers. We do have um, interruptions. So every six months, for example, during an observing run, there will be a break where, you know, the vacuum will be renewed, engineers will go in, um, et cetera, et cetera. But um, my understanding is that they come extremely highly polished from the manufacturer of this extremely uh, smooth surface. And, um, you know, if there's a speckle of dust, they kind of, you know, really, really, I mean, they see it, you see it immediately, but there are, there are thousands of witness channels. Hello. You're still here, Patricia. I don't know what's happened to your screen, but it um, doesn't matter. We can still hear okay. you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and my, my Zoom just disappeared entirely, so I was worried. Um, yeah, and so so they, they do go and, and clean if necessary. Um, but as I said, they try to maintain this extremely high vacuum, which obviously shouldn't accumulate any dust. Yeah, fantastic. Brilliant. Right. On to a question about white dwarfs, actually, or more to the point, I guess, detection limits of these gravitational waves. Uh, John's asked, uh, can the gravitational waves from the merger of two white dwarfs be detected? And if so, from what distance? Yeah, so that is a very good question and a very topical question. So, so white dwarfs, um, they they are. We could, in principle, see them, but their their signal because they're not as compact as neutron stars and and black holes is too weak. So they are outside our sensitivity range. So white dwarfs are nothing we in LIGO look at. However, having said that, <laughs> it's a key source for Lisa. Lisa will be able to detect um, binary white dwarfs in the galaxy. So that's the that's the limit here. So that's what we're talking about. Exciting. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Um, David's asked, what is the predicted maximum mass of a black hole created by a supernova? Ah, that is also a very good question. And I didn't mention that, but that's why this intermediate mass discovery was so exciting. So there is, you know, depending on who you talk to between maybe, you know, like up to 80, 85 solar masses might be, you might be able to create that. But then there is a gap. It's what's called the upper mass gap, because there is a phenomenon called pulsational pair instability supernova that prevents you um, from creating a black hole that's heavier because you have these pulsations and these pulsations lose the mass of the star. So if you lose mass of your initial star, then of course the black hole you form at the end will be lighter. And, and you know, there is, this, there is this gap. So it's really difficult to populate that with a standard stellar process. You can go beyond that with really massive stars and then have, my understanding is you can then again create quite heavy black holes, but it's this in between. And that's why this GW 190521 was particularly exciting. Fantastic. And I actually think that's answered the next question, but I'm going to ask it anyway on behalf of John. He's put that nothing can escape from a black hole, but the final mass of the merger is less than the sum of the progenitor mass. Does this mean that in some way that masses escape from the black hole? But I'm assuming that's a similar answer, if not the same one. That's a very good question. So what actually happens is um, it's, it's a very similar, it's, you know, think about GR. What happens is actually you have your two individual masses, but you also have the binding energy between the two, right? And then you emit gravitational waves. And we know in these mergers, we can calculate and there's a prediction and they emit about three solar masses. So three solar masses of your initial black holes get converted into gravitational radiation. And that's way more energetic than, for example, what the sun produces every day. So these are some of the most energetic, um, there's a tiny wiggles, but in terms of the energy that's in those gravitational waves, it's insane. Brilliant, yeah, fantastic. Um, and the questions keep coming. I may have to curtail some of these ladies and gents, <laughs> but we'll get through as many as we can. Uh, thank you, Kevin, this is an interesting one. Um, Kevin asks, you mentioned that GO600 is approximately 600 meters in length and essentially used for technical development, whilst LIGO is about four kilometers. The question is, is there a minimum size for a GW detector for making measurements? So, I mean, I guess no in principle. What you happen, the shorter your wavelength goes, uh, so the shorter your arm length goes, the shorter is the, the wavelength of the gravitational wave you can detect. So that means the higher the frequency, right? So what you're effectively building, the shorter you go, you go to a really high frequency sensitive detector. So GEO 600, when I said it's mainly an R&D facility, it also does astrophysics because it's only 600 meters. It's actually quite a bit more sensitive in like the a few kilohertz range where LIGO is no longer quite that sensitive. Um, so that's why I made, yeah, I didn't say that, but if Beetlejuice goes supernova, GEO 600 is going to see it. <laughs> Superb. We will uh, keep our eyes and ears peeled. I think we've got three questions left, and I think it's only right that we ask them. So David, thank you for this one. He asks, 
how does one know that a black hole is spinning? Can one estimate how fast uh, if that has meaning? Yeah, so if it is spinning and we know it's spinning, how do we estimate the speed at which it rotates? No, that's a really good question. Um, the gravitational wave signal, and I didn't show it, um, looks different when you have a spinning black hole. So when you have spinning black hole, um, the rate at which you're in spiral, so for example, if they are just you know, perfectly aligned or anti-aligned or some combination of aligned and anti-aligned with the orbital motion, so the orbital angular momentum, then the spin mainly affects how quickly the in-spiral is. So you will accumulate either more or fewer gravitational wave cycles. So the phase will be different. So we can measure that from the gravitational wave signal and then deduce how fast the black hole was spinning. Now, if the spins are, you know, pointing in some arbitrary direction, which they may do, especially in a globular cluster, then this impacts also the shape of the gravitational waveform. It modulates it in a very specific way, depending on you know, how the spins are pointing and how fast the black holes are spinning. So this is a really excellent question. And it's one of the big things we, we want to really measure precisely because this could tell us really about the environment in which the black holes are formed. So the general belief is if you have black holes that form in a very you know, low density environment, what we call isolated formation, we expect them to be aligned with each other. Whereas if you go to a globular cluster, which is very dense, and we expect that there are a lot of black holes at the center of this and you know, encountering each other all the time and forming binaries or even you know, multiples, then we expect the black hole spins to have some random orientation. And so that would be really exciting to kneeling down, you know, maybe certain types of black holes prefer environment X and other ones environment Y. So good oh, question. Brilliant. Yeah, there was more depth to that answer than I had anticipated. Brilliant. Okay, there's a few more. So uh, John asks, what influence do the magnetic fields in black holes and neutron stars have in the shape and frequency of the merger signal? So what's the influence of the magnetic fields in those particular objects? Yeah, so black, um, I mean, for neutron stars, right, there's measurements of whole ranges of, 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 of magnetic fields. So it doesn't really impact so much the gravitational interaction and the dynamics, so in terms of the gravitational wave signal, but it has a huge impact on the electromagnetic signal that you create. Um, so magnetic fields really play a big role in terms of how the electromagnetic signatures of the light curve that is being created in the aftermath looks like. And I mean, astrophysicists would be really excited. Um, to understand more about the magnetic fields. Fantastic. I'm going to say we're going to accept any more questions and I will promise we will finish before <laughs> half past, but I think there may be two or three. That it, I think it's just testament, to, uh, Patricia, to the... I, I ran testament. over as well and we started yeah. late because of the glitch, so... <laughs> that, that's brilliant. So, um, Lawrence, thank you for your question. Uh, Lawrence asks, I understand that gravitational radiation diminishes as the inverse of the distance as opposed to the inverse square for EM radiation. Uh, is this correct? And if so, what advantages can it give, e.g. for probing the early universe? Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. Um, it is a, a one of our um, fall off in terms of the strain. So you're absolutely right there. Um, you know, in terms of the, the early universe, um, you know, as long as the signal is, 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 is strong enough, right, in particular for the stochastic background, or if you have something that is a bit more exotic, like a potentially a phase transition or something in the early universe that will have a very characteristic, right, as long as this is still, you know, a reasonable, within our sensitivity range, I should say, um, you, you can really go deep and probe the universe. You're not limited, so you can go much further back, I think is what I'm trying to say, than with the CMB, because there you're limited to the surface of last scattering, Right, because before that you can't go it's opaque right but with gravitational waves you can go closer to the big bang i, I guess that's the answer you're looking for and yes yes you can <laughs> brilliant okay i'm going to actually condense the two questions one from david and rob together um and they ask um it is theorized that stars in the very early universe were super 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 massive um is there any evidence uh, of this in the remnants of the mergers uh, and rob asked a similar question but he says that LIGO detects black holes that are slow spinning. Um, is that still the case in contrast to the electromagnetically detected ones? Okay, so these are not really connected questions. So the first one is, is the POP3 question. And, and I'm, I'm not a very good expert on, on stellar astrophysics, I have to admit. Um, but yes, that is the POP, that is, you know, that is what postulated that the very early stars were really, really heavy. So you would expect that, you know, 
they form quite massive black holes. Now, I think to really nail this down, you want to prove the history, right? Because very early, that means they were formed at high redshifts. And that's not really something we are probing just yet. So we really need to get to a higher sensitivity, you know, the, the furthest, I mean, with some uncertainty, right? Redshift that we have probed so far is about a redshift of one. So for these pop three stars, I think you really want to go, or the, the remnants of pop three stars, you know, you want to go to larger, to larger um, redshifts. That I mean, that's my wishy-washy answer because I'm not, I'm not too sure about that. To be perfectly honest, um, remind me of the second question. Uh, Rob asked, uh, "Is it still the case that most of the LIGO detected black holes are slow spinning in contrast to the electromagnetic de detected ones?" Yeah, so uh, most of the observations we have had from, from the LIGO Vigo observations, they are consistent with slowly spinning stars, though we had some that clearly show either a positive or a negative spin component in the binary system. And there's also some weak evidence in the population, at least, for some misalignment with the spins. Now, with regards to the spin measurements on the electromagnetic side, they have huge error bars, right? So what people do there is they use this kind of Doppler shifting of the iron line, and that has massive error bars, right? So even there where you see the ones that claim a 0.9, you'll essentially get, you know, a 0.9 error on it. So I, I would take it with a pinch of salt. Um, but yeah, that will be incredibly interesting to see if, you know, if, you know, the AM bars, error bars shrink and LIGO might not ever see really highly spinning one. I think this is also going to tell us something really interesting um, about, you know, different types of populations and environments. So yeah, should keep an eye out for that. Brilliant. And I think that segues nicely actually into our final question, looking forward and maybe joining up some different areas of uh, physics. So David asks, um, Dr. Schmidt, do you think it might be possible in the future for gravitational waves to be used to investigate dark matter? That would assume that dark matter can uh, congregate into objects massive enough for the detectors to detect. How could we tell the difference between, say, a chunk of dark matter and something like a white dwarf? That is a very, very good question. So before specifically answering your question, right, having observed quite an abundance of black holes with quite high masses, you might have seen a lot of papers and people getting excited about multi-component dark matter and could black holes be one component of dark matter, right? And I don't think that question is definitively settled yet, right? So it could already be that maybe these I mean, if they are so populous out there, right? Maybe they contribute a significant fraction to dark matter in the first place. With regards to direct measurements of dark or the influence of dark matter, so if you have, for example, in a in a halo object, so right, if we have, you know, an IMRI, for example, so we have an extreme mass ratio in spiral or an intermediate mass ratio in spiral, so a smaller black hole into a, a large, a really large black hole, right? So ten to the five solar masses or something like that, but in a halo you know, submerged in a dark matter halo, you should be able to see an impact again on the gravitational wave phase. You can think about the dark matter because it's interacting gravitationally as a viscous fluid that will slow down the in spiral of that object. And that would leave, or is expected to leave, you know, a clear signature in, in the gravitational wave signal. And so you could I mean, I'm not sure about the generacies and whether you could really uniquely identify it this way, but this is one way of thinking about probing uh, the presence of dark matter when you look at gravitational waves. Fantastic. Thank you ever so much. It's been a fantastic evening. Um, thank you to everybody that's joined us and all the questions. Um, we are going to finish very shortly now. So thank you to everybody for joining us.